from here in Sydney. Good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast, I believe we're all on the same time frame now as of the weekend. But obviously, if you're on Perth time, good morning. And if you're in the UK, a very, very good morning to you both as well. Um, my name is Paul Wright, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at the Australian British Chamber of Commerce. And thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on the very, very uh, topical subject right now of are you maximising all of the opportunities you can for your business and employees through fringe benefit tax? Uh, before we get started, I would first of all like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. As I'm in Sydney, that would be the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So we have a fantastic webinar for you today. Uh, you know, COVID has definitely shifted the way that we've been doing uh, doing our work, both you know working remotely as well as uh, you know adapting back in the office environment. Um, and this is a great opportunity to really understand more about how you need to fully consider all of the changes and potential benefits with regards to fringe benefit tax. And as I was saying to Katie a little bit earlier, when we first started having this conversation about doing uh, this webinar on this topic, uh, I myself didn't know too much uh, on the topic, but as I started speaking to many of our members, as well as family and friends, you know, everybody, is, it is a big talking point right now, not just for businesses, but for individuals as well. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to be able to utilize um, Katie Lynn, who's gonna give us her expert uh, analysis of, of everything that's going on. And we're delighted to partner with our very, very strong partners at Next Year Australia on this event today. Um, so the format of today's webinar, I'll shortly introduce Katie Lynn uh, to everybody um, on the webinar. Um, Katie will speak for approximately about 40, 45 minutes. And obviously we wanna have ample amount of question and answers time at the end. So if you do have any questions, and I do hope you do, so please start thinking of some questions now. If you can put them inside the Q&A box, and then we'll make sure that, uh, that we'll come to as many of those as possible at the end of the, uh, of the webinar. Um, so allow me to introduce Katie Lynn. Uh, Katie Lynn is a partner at Nexia uh, Australia, Australia and one of Australia's leading employment tax experts. Katie has over 25 years experience advising businesses ranging from SMEs to multinational conglomerates on employment tax issues. Katie has extensive experience and a proven track record of assisting clients navigating legislative, legislative matters, including superannuation guarantees, payroll tax, and obviously fringe benefit tax. Uh, Katie's passionate about investing in her clients to, give, uh, to get to the heart of their needs. Katie's personal approach combined with strategy and logic ensures she delivers the best outcome for her clients. Her tailored service and dedication to client outcomes reinforces her well-deserved reputation and continually earns her trust and confidence in her clients. So I'm sure that we all feel that Katie's definitely the right person for, to, to take us through this call. So Katie, thank you so much again for your time and please um, over to yourself. Great, thank you, Paul. Okay. Uh, at Nexia Sydney, we've got 92 partners around Australia and 16, 613 staff, and we're one of the leading mid-tier accounting firms in Australia. We pride ourselves on partner-led teams and getting to the effective solutions for our clients. As always, there's a disclaimer today, um, and so everything that I talk about today is general in nature. Um, and uh, nothing there in terms of specific and also that legislation can change over time as well. So I'm delighted to be presenting today in relation to maximising opportunities uh, with benefits. A high number of Australian businesses are being challenged in attracting the right staff and obviously retaining them, whether that be professional services sector or other sectors within the economy. The skills shortage is having a genuine impact on productivity and profitability of businesses. Remuneration, salary packaging, and offering intrinsic benefits to staff are becoming more important on staff demands, more due to inflationary pressures and cost of living. The war for talent is real. Potential candidates are asking, what is the value I can receive from you as my employer? And this could be in various ways. It might be requesting gym membership or whether it is flexibility, uh, maybe extra money or whether that's free food. How we reward our people and knowing what is important to them is key. 
Understanding the method of payment or packaging that best suits all stakeholders means that employers need to be aware of the financial and taxation considerations of offering these types of benefits. Potential staff need to understand what you're offering when they sign up to work for you and what keeps them empowered and how do they enable it. There may be opportunities that we speak through today that you may not be aware of that may help drive staff engagement and ultimately lead to greater productivity and enhanced loyalty within the organisation. As I begin, what is FBT? Tax on the provision of non-cash benefits in respect of employ employment. So we're not talking about any cash benefits, we're essentially talking any type of benefits that are being provided in non-cash format. So that could be the use of a car, it could be providing car parking to employees. The benefits are provided by an employer or it could be an arrangement by a third party where there might be another company that provides your employees with a benefit. And so understanding what that benefit might be or what that consists of. Typically what we see in those types of situations to encompass third party arrangements is where firms might have a company policy to say that to staff, if they receive a benefit from a third party or a supplier, that they need to document that so that that helps in terms of capturing that for FBT purposes. Today, we're only talking about benefits that are being provided to employees and associates, which could include family, friends, but we're not talking about benefits that are being provided to clients. Another topical issue, which is another topic for another day, is around employee contractor. So what we're picking up is benefits that are being provided to employees. In high court decisions recently, there were two decisions that were made around employee versus contractor. It's a very key topical issue at the moment, and it's important that you get that right. If you do have a contractor that potentially should be a deemed employee, those benefits the contractor are receiving should be also included for FBT purposes. Uh, not to mention also the POIG withholding superannuation guarantee risk for your business as well. We understand the, the steps to follow um, as we progress through today. Is there a benefit that's being provided to your employee? If so, what type of benefit is being received? Who is that provider or the recipient of that benefit? So who's actually received it as your employee? What I'm going to focus on today is four and five. Is it exempt or is it concessionally taxed for fringe benefits purposes? And can the taxable value be reduced? Has the employee made an after-tax contribution that will offset the liability? Does it have GST associated with the benefit? And lastly, is the benefit reportable? So today I'm focusing on how do I maximise the opportunity to provide fringe benefits to my employees? And this can be done in one of four ways. One that we're currently seeing is around replacing fringe benefits with grossed up salary. And so therefore accounting for the POYG withholding and the superannuation on cost of grossing up the after-tax amount. And I'll go through an example in a moment. Secondly, providing benefits that are exempt from FBT or concessionally taxed. Thirdly, use of employee contributions, allowing employees to contribute to the benefits that you're providing to your employees. Lastly, the otherwise deductible will rule, providing a benefit that the employee would have been entitled to claim as an income tax deduction. So the agenda for today is to cover those four benefits in relation to maximising the opportunities from a fringe benefit perspective. I wanted to cover off some other considerations that you need to be aware of. And lastly, car parking. Whilst there's some exemptions available for that, I have put that in a separate topic because it is new for this year. Lastly, FBT or audit activity. Again, I won't have time to cover that today, but I've put it in there more of a risk association. So for you to identify if there are risks associated and focusing exactly on what the ATO are looking for as they conduct their audit activity. Value versus opportunity. As you can see, 
the resident tax rates are, aren't at the top marginal rate for employees that are under $180,000. What we are seeing in organisations at the moment is with staff where their salary isn't at the $180,000 mark is what they're deciding to do is gross up the benefit in cash and providing a cash bonus to employees to recognise either their service or their uh, in terms of providing a benefit to them. But it's all via cash. The reason for that is with FBT, it is at the top marginal rate. So employers pay FBT at 47%, which as you can see, that takes out a large population where there needs to be under the $180,000 mark. It provides opportunity where employers can pay for that same benefit, but at a reduced cost. And how that best is uh, worked through is an example. So if I have an example where I've paid cash bonus to employees, so I've got Lucy and Lucy wants the organisation to pay her gym membership, which is $800. So by paying that gym membership, it would be subject to FBT. Calculating what that cost would be for the employer would be $702. So therefore, as an employer with the out cost, is the gym membership of the $800 plus the FBT of $700. So the total cost the employer is paying is just over $1,500. However, instead, if I'm the employer and I pay Lucy a cash bonus of just over $1,220, I don't have any FBT liability because it is a cash payment. And so therefore there will be income tax and superannuation associated with that. At Lucy's marginal rate of income tax, which is the 34.5%, the 1221 bonus is equivalent to an $800 in after-tax income. Therefore, on this simple scenario, the employer is saving $281. So if you multiply that out for an employee workforce, there's significant savings for employers. I have had some employers say, that employees would like to receive the non-cash benefits instead. Again, there is a, a place for that as well, but it's really working out, well, if you want to provide extra money to your employees, this is one way of doing that. Next, I wanted to cover the second point, which is the exempt or concessionally tax benefits. Now there's a large amount of them contained within the FBT legislation and I've provided over these next two pages a cheat sheet for you that summarises each of the different benefits that are exempt or concessionally taxed and allowing you to easily find that in accordance with the FBT legislation. I'll cover most of them today but in case of the ones that I don't it provides you an easy reference to go back from an FBT perspective. Similar here, so 58M with employee health, there's quite a lot as well. So that's a cheat sheet that allows you to go back in terms of the ones that I don't cover today, but you might wanna have a look at in greater detail. The minor benefit exemption threshold. So this is where employers can provide employees with a benefit that is less than $300 inclusive of GST the conditions are that it needs to be provided on an infrequent and a regular basis. And if that satisfies those conditions, it will be exempt from FBT. When the tax office re released the ruling uh, to 2007-12, uh, they haven't itemised the frequency. And again, it's back to employers in relation to their risk profile as to how much they deem to be infrequent and irregular. In terms of the minor benefit, it's important also to consider the tax deduction and GST credits. So if you are providing a minor benefit exemption to an employee, the employer will get a tax deduction for that benefit and they'll also be entitled to the GST credit. It doesn't, however, relate to meal entertainment. If you are relying upon the actual method for meal entertainment, the minor benefit uh, will be exempted from FBT 
but you won't get a corresponding tax deduction or a GST credit in relation to those expenses. So it's important to note the minor benefit exemption doesn't apply to in-house fringe benefits, and I'll touch on that briefly, but again, that's a session in itself. Meal entertainment, where the employer is using 50-50 method, or benefits provided under a salary sacrifice arrangement. I often see uh, when reviewing fringe benefits, uh, tax work papers is around the in-house benefit. So if employers are accessing the in-house benefit, they get to a value that's less than $300, they use the minor benefit. But unfortunately, under the legislation, uh, employers are unable to use the minor benefit in conjunction with the in-house benefit. In relation to meal entertainment, we are seeing a large number of organisations leading up to COVID and since COVID use the actual method for meal entertainment. And that's a, a consideration, and I've got there a consideration from a tax impact for meal entertainment. Where you're using actuals and the minor benefit applies, then you won't be able to get a tax deduction or a GST credit for those benefits. However, if an employer is using the 50-50 method, then you will get 50% as a tax deduction and 50% GST credit. It really depends and is concerned around who you're providing that meal entertainment to. Is it mainly employees or is it mainly clients? We have the long service award exemption threshold under 58Q, which allows $1,000 for 15 years of service. And for every year after the 15 years, you get $100. So you might accrue. So if you've got an employee that has worked for you for 20 years, you would have used the 15 Year, the 15 years and gave $1,000 or up to $1,000 for the employee. And then at 20 years, you would have $500, again, that you could exempt in relation to the exemption for long service awards. There's also the safety award exemption under 58R, which allows $200 per employee per FBT year as well. In-house benefit reduction, so that's where you're providing employees with a discount on the sale price of goods you sell or the services you provide to the general public. And the rules are set out under section 42. Under these in-house benefit reductions, you are allowed to get an, exempt, an exemption for $1,000 per employee per FBT year. Moving on to portable electronic devices. So under 58X, you're able to, as an employer, provide portable electronic devices that are mainly used for work purposes and they will be exempt from fringe benefits. It applies to one item per FPT year that have a substantially identical function, unless it's a replacement. Important to note here for small businesses where their aggregate, aggregated turnover is less than $50 million, you can provide employees with more than one work-related electronic device in an FBT year, even if they have substantially identical functions. I have summarised there, essentially a portable electronic device, uh, easily portable, small, is designed to uh, work without the external power supply. So we're looking for mobile phones, laptops, tablets, portable printers. Again, so that's worthwhile considering if you aren't already providing those benefits to staff. Under 58X, we've also got the deduction around software, um, protective clothing, briefcases and tools of trade. So there's an exemption there. If you're providing employees with any of those types of benefits, they will be exempt from FBT. The limit is one per year, so similar to the one I just spoke about, but unless it's a re replacement item again. Given where we are in the market at the moment um, and some of the headlines that have been around the country around reducing headcount and reducing workforce, 58ZE is retraining and reskilling exemption. So if you're providing training or education to employees that are redundant or soon to be made redundant, they will be exempt from FBT. So the cost of retraining and reskilling provided by the employer will be exempt if 
The retraining and the reskilling is provided to a redundant or soon to be made redundant employee. You have complied with your obligations under the Fair Work Act as an employer, and the education or training is both not related to their current job role and for the primary purpose of helping them gain new employment. So the exemption covers the provision of educational training, so you might be reimbursing or paying for course fees, or the cost of delivering training. Associated benefits, including course materials, textbooks, travel and accommodation. It's important to note with this exemption, there are no limits on the number of training or education courses that an employee can undertake, or also what the cost of education or training is as part of this exemption. COVID has certainly changed the way we work. I wanted to put the next two slides as a, re, a reformer in relation to assisting people where you might have um, a hybrid workforce. Where you are as an employer providing counselling to support an employee who is working from home, there won't be any FBT associated with that. That will fall under 58M work-related counselling. Similarly, if you're providing healthcare to an employee who's working from home, there won't be any FBT under 58M under work-related preventative healthcare. And I've listed out there the what needs to happen to be able to qualify for that exemption. I know we do have some FBT exempt employers and rebateable employers on the seminar today. It's important to note the benefits of salary packaging for staff working for your organisation. I'm often alarmed at the lack of knowledge or guidance provided to employees working in these industries. And so I understand there's challenges that are being faced when you have employees coming in um, and understanding, is this too good to be true? And so when I've been working with organisations, it's really around educating them that this benefit is something they're entitled to um, and making sure that they maximise that. Essentially for the FBT exempt and also rebateable employers like schools, they do have the benefit of grossing up non-deductible expenses as part of their salary package. And so essentially they get 15899 if we're talking about a type two benefit. So they can essentially get 15,900 of benefits paid off their mortgage in each FBT year. It's just important to note the full FBT applies except for employer provided entertainment. And if it's salary package entertainment, it's reportable on payment summaries. Some common issues when I'm reviewing and discussing with these types of organizations it's important to note that you don't apportion that rebate. It is in, if a person starts halfway through the year, they're still entitled to the full FBT rebate. If an employee doesn't use their cap, unfortunately it is lost. They cannot carry it forward until the next year. So it's important as part of that salary packaging, making sure those benefits are included as part of that salary package by the 31st of March. So I did see a lot of correspondence by organisations to make sure that they had their employees uh, maximise their benefits in terms of their salary package. If an employee doesn't use their cap, the employer cannot use that excess to and give that to other employees. The other entitlement for for purpose entities allow salary packaging of meal entertainment and entertainment facility leasing expenses. Where you both have FBT exempt employers and rebateable employers, they both still get the opportunity to provide salary packaging meal entertainment. You can see on the slides there, type one is 2,400 and type two is 2,600. So many not-for-profit employers offer this salary packaging of meal entertainment to employees, capped at those respective amounts, depending on type one or type two. It's important to note that this includes dining meals only and excludes takeaway and home delivery. During COVID, they had made an exception to the rule, uh, but back in 2023 for FBT return, the Uber Eats don't count as part of this salary packaging. 
So some examples include the venue hire when you have exclusive use of those premises. And so it excludes where there's, you know, you have to have exclusive use of that premises. So whether that's a separate room or a distinct area in a larger space. Holiday accommodation, so hotel costs. Important to note that no travel costs are associated and can't be salary packaged, but the, ho the hotel or accommodation can be. Meals, so cafes, restaurants, hotels, there needs to be two or more people dining. It's important to note that it doesn't include takeaway food, groceries or travel cost. Cars. A motor vehicle that's designed to carry less than one tonne and less than nine passengers. If they carry greater than one tonne or greater than eight passengers, it isn't a car fringe benefit and it may fall under the residual benefit provisions and they will need to be calculated separately for fringe benefits purposes. Are there exemptions for cars? Yes, there are. I'll cover off the electric vehicles in a moment, but that's our obviously new one for the 2023 FBT return. We have the panel van or a utility truck designed to carry a load of less than one tonne or any other road vehicle designed to carry a load of less than one tonne and not principally designed to carry passengers. So both of them are exempt fringe benefits if the private use is limited to home to work travel and other private travel is minor, infrequent and irregular. Once that private travel tips over to consider that it is frequent and irregular, then FBT will be applied in a similar way to work out what the car fringe benefit amount would be. We are aware through compliance measures at the moment with the ATO, they do take a narrow view on the definition of minor infrequent. And I suggest they're considering a logbook to be able to be comfortable that the vehicles are being used minor infrequently and satisfy that exemption. Electric vehicles. So these announcement uh, was made some time ago, but getting it through the House of Parliament, uh, both houses uh, caused a little concern and that the uh, both parties needed to give a little. So what we eventually had is legislation from 1 July 22, where employers won't pay FBT on eligible electric cars and associated car expenses if all of the conditions are met. The first, the car is a zero or low emission vehicle. The first time the car is both held and used is on or after 1 July 2022. And lastly, the luxury car tax has never been payable. And so for the 2023 year, the limit is 84916, including GST. And so there are concerns, and so it's around if there are with the luxury car, if there is some add-ons, or there's also the consideration around in some states they're providing rebates. And so if the car was greater than the 84916 and that the rebate reduces it, does that still qualify? And we're waiting on guidance from the ATO to confirm that that is the case, or whether if it is greater, uh, then they won't satisfy the exemption. The car must be zero or low emissions. So we are talking about battery electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids. Now it's important to note the plug-in hybrids have a C state uh, where they won't be eligible for FBT from 1 April 25. Uh, in relation to the motor vehicles, it is a car designed to carry a load of less than one tonne and fewer than nine passengers. Important to note that in the legislation, it excludes electric motorcycles. So these aren't part of the concessionally taxed or, or FBT exempt uh, vehicles. It can apply to secondhand electric vehicles, but similar, those conditions need to be met that it was first held after 1 July 2022, and also that there has never been any luxury car tax paid. So those two conditions need to be met. So practically, it might be a little challenging around the secondhand vehicles, but it's working out and ascertaining what that cost looks like. 
and when they were first purchased in terms of the vehicle. As part of getting it, as part of getting the legislation through the House of Parliament, there is a formal review that has been commissioned um, just to confirm what the effectiveness and also the uptake of electric vehicles has been. And so that will happen after the third year of operation. The plug-in hybrids with the C state of 1 April 25. So from 1 April, you can only continue to apply the exemption if the use of the plug-in hybrid was exempt before 1 April 25, and that you have a financially binding commitment to continue providing that private use of the vehicle after 1 April. So it's important to note if there's an extension or an alteration of the existing agreement or contract, then that will ultimately consider that to be not binding. And so therefore, it's essentially would be uh, subject to FBT at that point in time. Likewise, if employees were changing an employer, uh, that would also uh, negate the financial binding commitment and would then mean that FBT is payable. And an illustrative example here is if an employee is on 200K remuneration package and the provision of an $80,000 car, you can see here that under a petrol car, there is FBT associated with that. For the time being, I haven't considered the pre post contributions, but to illustrate the example of if all being equal, the petrol car would involve FBT of $16,000, whereas if the vehicle was salary packaged and it was exempt electric car, then the employee would still receive that in greater cash and superannuation as part of their remuneration, as there, as there won't be any FBT associated with that. I have been asked in presentations before, what we are relying upon here is that there's two ways uh, that the electric car can be exempt. Firstly, it's a salary packaged agreement with the employee. And if that was an electric car, then that would satisfy the exemption. The second way is where an organization decides to change their fleet. And so the employer might be providing the electric vehicles for the employees to use. In both scenarios, it will be exempt from FBT. The associated car expenses are also exempt as part of the fringe benefit concession. And so those associated car expenses include registration, insurance, repairs and maintenance of the vehicle, uh, it's important to know their battery replacement. So I understand the cost of the battery replacements can be up to $10,000. So if it's a replacement, it will be exempt, but similar to our revenue versus capital, if it's an improvement, it will be capital in nature and therefore won't satisfy the exemption. Fuel will also be associated car expense and novated lease payments. So all of those benefits will be exempt um, under the concessions. It's important to note the home charging station, is it an exempt item? No. So it may constitute a property fringe benefit. Uh, it's also important to note, and I don't know how this will work in practice, but if the charging infrastructure costs are included within the lease, it needs to be separately identifiable because that component will be subject to FBT. If the employee is reimbursed for the cost of purchasing or installing the charging location, then that would be an expense payment fringe benefit. Important to note as part of all of these is the software subscriptions. So they are not an associated car expense and neither is the car parking expenses related to charging the vehicle as well. From the employer's responsibility perspective, as an employer providing electric vehicles, Whilst the benefit, whilst the vehicles are exempt from FBT, there is a requirement to calculate the reportable fringe benefit amount. And that is required to be disclosed on the employee's payment summary. And so there is the administration around, is it purely 
a statutory formula calculation where it's 20% of the base value of the car and that's the amount that's disclosed on the payment summary for the employee? Or does the employee keep a logbook to effectively reduce the cost associated with the calculation of the reportable fringe benefit? And this is an important one as an employer, if you have employees that are interested in these electric vehicles, this is the one area that I see as part of the trap. And that's if you've got a $70,000 electric car, if you're multiplying that by the 20% base value, you get 14,000, gross it up to be put it on their reportable fringe benefit, you get $26,000. And so that amount, whilst it's exempt from FBT as an employer, we need to consider what the employee considerations are with that amount being disclosed on the payment summary. What are those benefits? If an individual is liable for Medicare levy surcharge or they're paying child support payments or recovery of help or hex debt, income tests for youth allowance, um, all of these types of benefits. So whilst it doesn't impact the individual's income tax position, it might have flow on effects for the benefits that essentially have uh, child support and income tax, income test measures. So it's important to note as an individual what those considerations might be. Other exempt vehicles for FBT is motorbikes. So provided the private travel is home to work or work to home, then they will be exempt from FBT. Dual cabs, an interesting conversation. So MT2024 sets out the dual cabs that qualify for this exemption. So the load carrying capacity is greater than one tonne, carries fewer than nine passengers or carry a load of less than one tonne, but not designed for the purpose of carrying passengers. So these dual cabs, we often saw or read in the newspaper around ATO investigators going out to uh, Friday, Saturday or weekend sports and seeing all of them at kids sports and whether they're being used for private purposes. Now the ATO is much more measured in their approach and they're using a lot more um, data that's available to them to be able to data match. So it's important to note as part of these dual cabs, the exemption provided allows for travel only between home to work, work to home, and in their example, they cover non-work related, that is minor, infrequent and irregular, such as the occasional use of the vehicle to remove domestic rubbish. So this journey would ordinarily be classified as private for all other vehicles and subject to FBT. So the exemption for dual cabs is an extra concession provided by the tax office. And so the practical compliance guideline there of 2018-3 allows employers to provide non-salary packaged dual cabs. However, the employee must have a policy in place that limits private use and the vehicle is GST inclusive, value is less than the luxury car limit. So if those three qualifications are satisfied, then the concession granted under the practical compliance guideline allows travel between home to work, you're allowed a diversion of two kilometres to the ordinary length of each trip, no more than a thousand kilometres in total, personal, uh, each FBT year, and no single return journey exceeds 200 kilometres. So I pose the question there, how do you gain comfort that the dual cabs are being restricted to the above guidelines? Uh, for example, do you have a company policy that sets out these are the conditions that we're providing you this dual cab? Uh, or alternatively, whether the employees need to sign a declaration to confirm that that is the case? I am seeing that organisations are using logbooks to be able to capture this data, to be able to ascertain whether there is the ability to use the minor and infrequent and that these journeys are being satisfied. Moving on to employee travel. 
So we have traveling overnight on work. So if we're providing travel to employees that are working overnight, then they will be otherwise deductible expenses and won't be subject to FBT. Similarly, we might have an employee that's living away from home. Whilst we had all those concessions back uh, 20, 2009, we do have some benefits that we can still provide to employees that are living away from home and they will be exempt from FBT. And we also have employees that have relocated. Whilst those costs are private in nature, there are other benefits and relocation benefits that we can provide to employees that are exempt from fringe benefits. The living away from home exemption is required that an employee maintains a home in Australia that isn't rented out. So what would satisfy that is the ownership interest, either legally or equitable, that they can include rentals. So if I'm renting an apartment in Sydney and I'm required to go to work in Brisbane, whilst I maintain that home that I'm renting in Sydney, then I'm effectively potentially living away from home. It's important to note that adult children living with parents, even though they might be paying board, won't satisfy the requirement to maintain a home in Australia. It's limited to 12 months at a particular location and the exemption can extend to accommodation and food. There's a lot of other concessions that I don't have time to talk through today where we've got the relocation, the temporary accommodation, there's overseas employers, where we have education of children that we can provide who are less than 25 years of age, we can salary package those costs as well. And similar, if you're in a remote area, there's another lot of concessions that are available. Employee contributions. So we often see employers asking for after-tax contributions. Now this might be in relation to innovated leases or car parking. It's important to note as part of those benefits, so if you were to provide some non-cash benefits to employees in the form, for example, car parking, what we're often seeing is the employers asking the employees to contribute some part of that cost. Um, it won't be potentially all of the car parking expense, but maybe asking for an after-tax contribution towards the car parking. If an employee is paying pre-tax for the car parking, it won't satisfy as a, an after-tax employee contribution. Otherwise deductible rule, uh, a reduction in that taxable value if the employee would have been entitled to claim the tax deduction. So for example, my institute membership fees, they would be exempt on the basis that they are otherwise deductible. I would be able to claim a tax deduction in my own name. Other considerations, I often get asked if I don't have a report or if I don't have a value associated with the FBT return. So all of my employee contributions offset the taxable value um, or the benefits are exempt. Should I lodge an FBT return? My advice is yes. And the reason being is the amendment period that I have there on the screen. Within three years from a lodgement date, the ATO has the opportunity to review. Our failure to register, there is no time limit to go back. A non-disclosure is six years. So effectively by lodging a nil FBT return, it captures that there will be a three year amendment period. Um, if you haven't registered, there is no time limit. So it, it puts in the uh, time cost to allow for the three years. I quickly wanted to talk on car parking. There are a number of concessions in relation to car parking. And again, this is an important topic given that it's new for the 2023 year. There's an exemption for employers who are non-profit, scientific, religious, or public educational institutions. So you don't pay car parking if you are providing car parking to employees. If you have spots that are dedicated for disabled people um, that are holding that permit, then they are exempt as well. Visitor car spots are also not subject to FBT. If you're providing a parking spot for a motorcycle or bicycle, that's also exempt. Providing parking to a non-car, so we're talking there over one tonne, there won't be any FBT associated with that as well. 
It is important to note that if you do have an exempt car, it will still be subject to FBT for car parking. Important to note for the small business exemption, the aggregated turnover, if it's less than $50 million and the car parking isn't provided at a commercial car parking station, then you will also be exempt from car parking fringe benefits. So there are all the exemptions available for car parking. If the car is parked at premises that are owned, leased or otherwise under the control of the employer. The commercial parking station charges more than the annual threshold. So I have those rates there for all day parking located within one kilometer of the parking facility, then you will have a, a car parking fringe benefit. I have had clients ask, and, and again, this is an opportunity around reducing the cost. With employees working in a hybrid workplace now, and so employees are coming into the office, I have seen employers pay and reimburse their car parking expense. Now, if you as an employer don't own, lease or have control over that car park, then it won't be a car parking fringe benefit. Instead, it will be an expense payment fringe benefit because you are reimbursing an expense. And so therefore it will be treated differently than a car parking fringe benefit. And again, it might be not it might not be treated as a concessional benefit as well. So the new rules uh, that were released in 2021 too, if two or more of these are displayed, then it will be a commercial car park. The facility has clear signage visible from the street advertising that paid parking is available. The facility has mechanisms to control who can enter and exit. So we've got boom gates or pay and display. And the facility charges more than a nominal fee for paid parking, then it will satisfy the commercial car park. The ATO has confirmed that the lowest representative fee charged may include early bird or car parking, as long as there's a reasonable number of parking spaces that are set aside. It's important to note though, when you are working out what the lowest representative fee is, if it's for longer term parking that allows uh, employers it allows employees not to enter and exit on a daily basis, then that representative fee won't be considered. Or also if it's specific and it won't allow general public to park, then again, that will be um, disqualified in relation to working out what the lowest representative fee is. So given this is a new area around car parking and how it is being considered, what I am advising employers is to identify all locations that you are operating. So locate all sites that your business is operating. Secondly, check if employees are being provided with car parking. If they are, does a liability exist at 1 April that you are charging greater than the benchmark interest rate? It's important to note that where you are providing a car park, that benefit might be less than the benchmark threshold, but it's important to consider the 1K radius. So if in that 1K radius, there is a commercial car park that is charging greater than the FBT rate, then you will have a fringe benefit. How do you understand the usage of the car park and what kind of availability of records do you have? Do you keep a log of the employees coming in and out? Are they parking for less than four hours? So again, you might have um, an opportunity to reduce the fringe benefits. Which way are you going to count the benefits? Is it actual statutory? Are you gonna keep a 12 week register and value benefits? And lastly, to calculate the fringe benefit. It's important to note as part of the car parking, where we have had universities, schools, hotels, Previously, they weren't considered a commercial car park. These are all now being considered as commercial car parks. So what I encourage in terms of reducing fringe benefits is potentially obtaining a market valuation. Depending on where your office location site is, it might be beneficial to obtain a market valuation, which may then reduce the FBT that you need to pay. And lastly, I'll leave these slides on the FBT audit activity for you to read at your leisure. Um, it's important to note that the ATO is focusing on fringe benefits 
And I do see that that being uh, more and more focused in their targeted reviews. So I'll stop there, Paul, in relation to FBT and the exemptions. I could talk a lot longer, but uh, given the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll stop now. No, that was fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Katie. You know, as you say, I know that you could have gone on a lot longer because there, there are so many intrinsical parts of, uh, of the FBT that, you know, that, that, that we just overlook and we don't really think about all the different areas. So, but I thought, yeah, the presentation, absolutely fantastic. Wonderful to get such great insights from you. And, and obviously, I know that, uh, that our attendees really enjoyed it as well. Um, so now, obviously, we do have, uh, you know, still about 10 minutes, nine minutes uh, uh, time for questions. So obviously, we have had some questions that come through, but we've still got availability for more questions to come through as well. But maybe I will start, Katie. Now, obviously, as, as you, you, know, you went through all those different areas, and there's so many more areas of, of fringe benefit tax that you know, we all need to be aware of, you're always going to find companies that, you know, that don't utilize the services or the expertise of you know, Next Year Australia, for instance. What do you see as the, the main disadvantages that, that these companies have or, or what, are, what are they missing out on by not utilising a company like Next Year and yourself? Thanks, Paul, for the question. Um, really, I see that access to what I've spoken about today in terms of what exemptions, what reductions in fringe benefits can you um, provide so that you're not paying fringe benefits. Um, an example might be uh, I helped a client where they were paying car parking and they were valuing it at what their rate is that they're charging. Um, I was able to significantly reduce the fringe benefits as part of the recalculation of what the car parking fringe benefit was to reduce that by $30,000, $35,000. And so mm -hmm. in terms of that, it's a significant reduction. So I do encourage organisations where they are preparing their fringe benefits returns in-house or they aren't being reviewed by a tax agent, that I encourage you to do that because that allows for opportunities. And it might also identify as part of governance and governance we speak about a lot, Paul, around making sure that the board is comfortable that from a risk profile that they're not going to end up in the papers or in the headlines around uh, fringe benefits that haven't been disclosed. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's why I'd say, you know, for, for anybody on this call and obviously anybody that's seeing this recording once it's released on our, on our website as well, uh, a perfect opportunity to be able to obviously approach Katie and, uh, and discuss this further. And so one of our attendees has sent a, a question here, uh, said for part-time employees, salary packaging in not-for-profit is, is full 15,889 available. Is there a minimum hours part-time for this to apply? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So as long as you are gainfully employed and have a contract, then there is no, um, there's no uh, requirement to have minimum hours. Um, obviously, in relation to their contract, they would have this is how many, uh, so this is the amount that they're being paid. So obviously making sure that it's greater than the $15,899. Um, if that's the case and everything else all being equal, then they could salary package that. But if an employee was working less and obviously working and their value of the contract that they are working is less than that amount, then they'd be entitled to that amount that they're up to their contract. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from one of our attendees. Can you recommend any companies that provide portals and management of salary sacrifice schemes? Uh, do you provide partner with anyone uh, at that next year? We don't salary, we don't partner with any salary packaging firms, but there are a large number of uh, salary packaging firms that are out there. Um, it really depends on what benefits, and I see pros and cons with a lot. And as I, I'm, I'm not a partner affiliated with any, but um, there are a large number that if you're looking to do exempt vehicles and they're focusing on exempt vehicles. Um, if they are more for not-for-profit, then I know there are salary packaging providers that are focused more in that market. It really depends in relation to uh, what those, uh, where you are in the organisation in terms of uh, whether that you're a not-for-profit or also whether you, um, how many employees you have. So in terms of as you would expect it anywhere in the organisation. If you've only got a couple of employees, then there are some contacts that I could refer you to that have um, those, those capabilities. Um, obviously, for the larger salary packaging providers, they're after a lot more 
turn over a lot more employees. So it really depends in relation to how many employees you have in the organisation that you're looking at salary packaging for mm -hmm. um, and what you're trying to salary package. But again, if you do have any questions or recommendations, happy for you to reach out to me and I can um, uh, and steer you in the right direction based on the experience that I've had. No, fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, another one here. If you lease uh, parking spaces with your office space, so included in rent, do not charge employees for them and they're open for use for all on a first come first uh, basis, not always used. Um, and you're not a small business. Oh, it's a long question. Will fringe benefit tax apply? Short answer is yes. Right. <laughs> so um, because you as the employer, it's covered in the lease. And so therefore you have control of it. So therefore it's a car parking fringe benefit. Um, if you don't have any records as to how frequent, so in, in that instance, there might be some that aren't being used, but if you're not able to identify that, um, then you'll be subject on the full amount that's part of that lease. Uh, and that's why in terms of reducing fringe benefits, it might be keeping a log um, or whether you have access to Boomgate data that allows employee, that tracks employees as to whether, how many employees you have, if you've got 10 car spots, and you've only had eight people come in and out, then you might be limited to eight. It really depends in relation to the documentation that you have surrounding that. But if in the absence of not having any documentation, you're looking at worst case scenario, 10, for example, 10 car parks, and then you're valuing it. And then it comes back to what that valuation looks like um, times 228. So the standard formula allows for the business work days. Again, in this population where you do have the agile and you do have that flexibility, we are seeing more and more logs being kept because um, if an employee isn't using it and no one else can, then there's obviously an opportunity there. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another question as well, they're coming in thick and fast at the moment. Um, if you lease parking spaces with your office space, oh no, we've already done that one. Where was the one that was just before that one? Um, oh, I think they may have rewritten it. That's fine. Uh, one of our other attendees has, has actually asked, can they get copies of the slides after the presentation? I didn't know if you'd be happy for us to, to share these slides with all of our attendees. Uh, absolutely, Paul. And I, I put it in so that there is a lot of content. There's a lot of cheat sheets in terms of exemptions. The FBT legislation is quite complicated. So I've tried to make it clear for um, the attendees to be able to reference back to those exemptions if they wanted to understand more. Mm -hmm. And obviously quite happy to uh, answer any questions that they um, that they have as well in terms of the audience. No, fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Um, yes, that question has just come back. So the, the final question, because I was just conscious of time. Um, oh, give me one second. Here we are. How can a professional services firm minimise fringe benefit tax in entertainment expenses? Also, how are these handled? Uh, when some of these are incurred when employees are living away from home? Okay, so the, the first part of that question, a professional services firm reducing uh, FBT on meal entertainment. In entertainment expenses, yeah. Uh, short answer is reduce the entertainment um, <laughs> on the basis that that's not happening. And, and obviously, as we are seeing more and more with COVID being relaxed, there is a lot more entertainment. You have two methods. You have the actual method and you have 50-50. The actual method obviously allows for a lot more record keeping, but again, can attribute a lot more in terms of exemptions for FBT. So at each event, you need to keep track of each individual that's attending the event. And provided that over the course of the FBT year, that employees haven't been at, I'm recommending to employ ERS 12 times. So if it hasn't been more than 12 times that an employee has attended an event, then it might be able to be exempt from FBT. The, others, the other way of doing that is with the actual method, you are able to use the in-house benefit. And so by providing property on house or on premises, that also allows for a deduction. So for example, those Friday night drinks in the office if that's being provided on the business premises, then that is exempt from FBT if you're using actual method as well. So it might mean that there is a lot more entertainment in-house um, that might 
be able to be reduced in terms of that's not even considered. So if it was greater than $300, that's okay. It's on in on premises. So again, that might be an opportunity as well to reduce that. Um, the last part of that question is around the LAFA. Um, and so that's really depending in relation to how you negotiate the contract with employees that are living away from home, um, whether that provided is a, in addition for the food that they would have paid for had they been still living in their previous location, there is the opportunity to reduce FBT on that, depending on how that's been structured. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Katie. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I know that we can we can keep going with, with more question and answers. And what I would do is I'd employ, uh, implore, sorry, obviously all of our attendees that are on this call today to please connect with Katie. Uh, obviously have those, those private conversations with Katie as well. And uh, it'd be wonderful to see how she can how she can support and assist all of you. But Katie, thank you so, so much again for your time. It's been absolutely wonderful hearing from you. Thank you so much, uh, Next Year Australia as well, our wonderful partners for, uh, for setting up this, this webinar as well. Um, and thank you everybody to, uh, who attended us today. Now, obviously we still have many more wonderful events taking place across the country for the rest of the year. So please uh, do go on our website to take a look at some of those. We look forward to seeing you at, uh, at future events. But um, I will leave you all today. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Katie, thank you so much again. And we thank look forward Paul. to seeing you all again soon. Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.